I clearly speak out of the last century. I'm, you know, not only do I I'll go out and look at things, I actually draw my, by hand. And, uh, you know, I've never been much fun of this, uh, what I call talk architecture. So, uh, although I talk very happily to you, of course, since you are such a nice audience. What I want to talk about today is sort of a be in my recent bonnet, and I change bonnets often, uh, that I kind of discovered when I looked closely at Houston. Architects have in, its voc in their vocabulary a very limited kind of conception of, of how one deals with cities. Namely, the only way is to organize them. It is to design them and to make them, you know, just comprehensible. Yet the fact is that most cit cities have a level of self-organization that we have even denied the existence of and know very little about. So uh, I'm very interested in this concept of, of self-organization, and I will explore it a little bit today. As everything I do, I approach it as an amateur. When I, heard, or heard, uh, when I heard this morning that we were experts, I reached for my revolver. I'm certainly not an expert. I don't claim any expertise. I only claim that uh, when I'm in doubt, I go out and look. And that seems to be to make a pretty good life. My carbon footprint is enormous since I do fly around a lot, which is not very nice. So. How the hell do I do this? What? Okay, is that okay? All right. Um, we are facing a fantastic expansion of cities in the world. The number of cities with over five million people is enormous, and it's growing in a dizzying uh, time, or dizzying pace. Uh, and it is really incomprehensible to understand how they are going to be shaped. And my argument is that we need, definitely need a measure of organization in order for self-organization to do the, the most part of the job. How do we do that? We don't really know. We know we have some examples of where it worked reasonably well, like in cities like Houston, but even in a place like, like Lagos, uh, as we will see in a couple of minutes, uh, organization has been essential to not drive it to total chaos. So there's so much written about cities and the growth of it. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but it is an enormous amount of information about what the dazzling uh, problems that we are going to face in these enormous urbanizations. So let's just look for very briefly here. So I've never been to Lagos. Uh, Rem Kulhas went to Lagos, and he seemed to have had problem understanding it, which is absolutely understandable, as you will see in a couple of minutes. Well, and I'm, I'm trying to make a very simple point here. In the 70s, they had a moment of stable government in, in, uh, in, in the era of Lagos, and they built some very important uh, infrastructure. And that infrastructure has been absolutely essential for not to have total chaos. But you'll see all kinds of really interesting things happening in a place like this. Look at this use of a clover leaf. In, in the US, we have you know, uh, Mexican uh, custodians cutting the grass and planting, while here it's a bus, bus depot making uh, utter, utter use. And you see here the rub against organization and self-organization is, in fact, extremely productive. And look here, here you see the, the organizing element, that freeway that runs out in the water, and then a sawmill with enormous pollution uh, dumped in the, in the water and spreading its uh, horrible things uh, left and right. So we're facing very complicated problems. This is a fascinating picture to me. This, uh, this is about speed. If you look, the predominant vehicle here is public transportation. And at the same time, there's commerce going on because it moves so slowly that you can actually wander out here and sell stuff simultaneously, which is terrific, obviously, because then, then the whole street is now multipurpose. It's both 
a very, albeit a very slow way of getting to work. But secondly, it's also a shopping mall. So this is a, you know, an incredible sort of juxtaposition of things that we, we, we as organizers go, oh my gosh, this is impossible. They have to be separated, you know, bikers have to be on, on one route, and uh, you know, all of these obsessions we have is here, of course, defied, and it actually seemed to work, which is pretty cool. When you start to look closely how commerce and, 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 and habitation takes place, uh, you can learn something, but it's very difficult to look at this and learn anything really significant. You really have to do what I would call forensics. And that means to actually go out and look closely. Because if you don't look closely, you, don't, you won't see that particular of those things that are now extremely ephemeral that uh, Brett spent a long time talking about, all that software stuff. So I'm basically a contrarian. So when I heard during my, my uh, oh, many years in the university how all my uh, fancy friends from New York would always refer to places like Houston. Oh, that's just sprawl. It's not interesting. Just forget about it. I said to myself, ah, there must be something interesting about sprawl. I'll start to look at it closely. So that's what I did. And this book that, that uh, actually my, my friend Brett has published, so he actually does sort of 20th century stuff still, uh, like making books, despite all his talks. Uh, so I began. And I realized that nobody really looked closely since uh, Kevin Lynch at some of these environments that you actually don't see while walking, but while driving. So how do you read the city while driving? What happens to you? So I began then to develop a, a, a series of keywords that I won't spend any time on, but I can just list them. The Houston field, a vast, flat, seemingly endless plain, 50 feet over sea level. Moist prairie, it's a particular kind of prairie that is actually moist. So it's, it's uh, uh, and, and uh, it has, it's an oak savanna, a very fancy ecosystem that is uh, concentrated around bayous because the water is not allowed to sink through the soil. It has to go lateral and goes into the bayou that snakes itself over centuries all the way to the Bay of Mexico. And the zoemic canopy, which is a canopy of trees that literally creates a kind of living room for everyone. The field room underneath in which people is the, the public living room. Stim and dross, the stimulation and inactivity in a city like London. Uh, you have 24-7 you know, in a city like Houston. You have life occasionally, and then most of the time it's all dross, nothing happens. So I talk about an activity surface, that there, and I talk about the mega shapes, shapes are that you, you actually comprehend because you're driving, you see them much larger, and you form, and they consist of roughly of the similar elements. American distance, which is a very peculiar distance, it's because Americans like to overcome distance at the same time they like to make distance. They don't want to live next to the Jews. They don't want to live next to the blacks. They don't want to live next to themselves, or their mothers, or their brothers. So American distance is fundamental. At the same time, we wanted to overcome the country in a real high speed. Speed zones are fundamental kind of driving forces in cities like this. The vertebrae is the freeway. And then there is, there, there is a, uh, oh, uh, um, uh, the frontage roads. And then I made an abecedarium, which is a, a, a kind of book on all the different pieces that these cities are made up of. So if you, if, in case you didn't know, but uh, Houston is uh, in, roughly in the middle of the, of the American, North American continent there at the south, facing a beautiful bay, uh, and it's a big place. It is a polycentric city. It never really had a center more for a very, very brief, brief time. It's polycentric, which is very, very interesting. That means that you can literally read the city. The geographer spoke about that uh, every city can be many cities. Well, Houston is very much so. Uh, you, you have a medical city that has one of the biggest medical centers in the world. It is a, 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 um, uh, un the center for energy. Uh, the oil industry is still located at that. And uh, it's also many other things going on simultaneously. So it's multi-layered. 
So that which appears as just a sprawl at first, you realize that it's in fact extremely rich and quite complicated with lots of isolated elements that barely speak to each other, but at the same time also connect in various ways. So uh, here, the, the book, which I call One Million Acres and No Zoning, is literally a million acres, and there's no zoning. So it's a rather pedantic title, but it works well. It's a description. And it, it's part of the Texas Triangle, which is a fantastic piece of, uh, uh, you know, we, we people like uh, candidates like Perry is moving in there, you know, the old, our old uh, president. He's chopping wood out on his ranch, and there are cows roaming, and they're also wonderfully, uh, there are lots of gas, lots of oil still. And, and uh, Houston is uh, in the corner here to the right, and uh, San Antonio in the other corner, and Fort Worth, Dallas up the top, whereas where most of the architectural events happen in Houston uh, is in Texas today is up there. And there's Austin and Waco, you remember Waco, the, where they had this wonderful event they were shooting each other. Texas is a lively place. And uh, not a bad to live because you can do exactly what you want. And so, uh, What's very interesting about Houston is that in 1948, and this was really a city that grew relatively slow, slowly, although it had more cars in 1910 than any other American city. It was really after the war uh, that this enormous growth took place. And we had for a moment a planner, we don't have a planner anymore, that drew this diagram to the left in 1948. And it's peculiar how insightful that diagram is. If you look at it closely, there is virtually no public space in this city. It's really individual space. You have only public space in connection with schools, which is also uh, very, very clear when you, when you occupy a city. So I overlaid the current city, and he is almost right. He's not quite as right about that this is not this, it never really was a central city, really a central center. It was always, as I said before, uh, multi-centered. But you can overlay the current city pretty much like that, and it has remained like that. So in other words, that's a piece of infrastructure, an idea that has kept Houston in, within, within a certain kind of frame of, of, of uh, occupation. If you then look at... at um, enormous difference between a city like Houston and, for example, a city like um, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, the old San Juan that was planned when the Renaissance came to, to El, El Escorial and George and, and uh, Philip V, was it, that sent out his armada and they occupied and used the, the, the law of the Indies and made beautiful cities all across Latin America. Beautiful in the sense that they were based on, on the idea that it's what we call the architecture of the city. When you have an atrium building, you literally build the city at the same time. When you have pavilions, isolated elements, you need the freeways, and the architecture has lost, lost its power. In fact, I would argue that in cities like Houston to the left here, there should be radical decentralization. All the buildings could be disconnected from the, uh, from, from the net, and landscape architects should take over, leave the architects to the city. Because landscape architecture is the device to make these cities visible. And there we have an enormous opportunity to find ways of, of exploring space again. So this is one of the first uh, diagrams that I made, which is that I, I developed what I call a new vocabulary with all these mega shapes, the speed zone, for example, with the freeway in the middle, the frontage road on the sides. There is where the, the real estate moves faster than anywhere else. Everything moves faster there. There's a sort of the DNA of Highway America is in these frontage roads. And then you go into the, to, to, to under the canopy of trees, and there is slow. The only thing you hear is the rattle of these, uh, you know, um, uh, leaf blowers, the dumbest invention in the world where you take the leaves on your fly lot and you blow it on to your red labor's lot. And this is, how, this is really how, how we pass the buck in terms of, of our problems in cities like of this kind. And then the downtown, of course, which consists of roughly modern buildings. 
And you don't read them as singular buildings. You read them really as an object, like as a mega shape. And you can put that in your pocket and measure the world with it. And you see it, no, not never really in focus, always in the perimeter of your vision. Because you presumably have to keep your eye on the road. So each of these mega shapes have their own ecology. And a very distinct ecology that one can, can, can research very, very carefully. Trees are incredibly valuable in a city like this. And you, will see, you can literally read the demography of the city by looking at the canopy. The denser and the more beautiful trees, the richer people. And out in the poorer neighborhoods, there are very few trees. So uh, like in, uh, in New Orleans, you read it on slope. People living high above the floodplain are rich, and the poor live below. But here in Houston, it's the trees. So you realize each city is specific. And when you start looking at it carefully, you realize that there's specific characteristics that actually produce the kind of ambiance and quality of that city. The bayou, a magnificent, slow moving, not particularly nice, but ultimately uh, uh, there was an incredible uh, um, ecology around the bayous, and not so many, many trees in between in the original savanna. In those bayous, we had snakes and lots of mosquitoes, horrible things, crawlies and creepies. And of course, that has now been fixed by the, by the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers is a wonderful, wonderful operation. If you have trouble and you want to get from A to B, you call the Corps of Engineers. OK, problem with the bio, let's pave it. Puh. They paved the damn thing, destroyed it, of course, and put it in the back of everything. So they, and of course, they also destroyed New Orleans because they did a lousy job. It's not so hard to pour concrete, and so they're pretty good at this. But we flood still, and now we're getting slowly onto that. So my Houston, then, is a polycentric city. It's neither a traditional city nor a giant suburb, but an arsenal of moving pictures with the car as the camera, the freeway as the dolly, and I as the medium. You realize that you live in movies, and you realize that you need to have the same techniques that movie makers have jump cuts, when it's really ugly, you just close your eyes and watch the road. And when it gets pretty, you look again. So it's just like a movie. So you have things like this. Now, the self-organization in a city like Houston, how does it take place? It's a city that was originally um, kind of explored by the oil companies, what I like to call the, the the anti-market forces. They all, all they want is monopolies, of course. And uh, the market forces, the little guys, the good capitalists in my book, uh, they're trying to eke out a living of a piece of the action rather than own the whole action. They are, uh, you know, this, if you want to know more about this, you should read Brodel, fantastic French uh, historian. And uh, it, it's very clear here that what happened, for example, in the, out in the oil fields in Texas in the beginning, these anti-market forces bought up huge, or bought the lease on huge pieces of land, but they didn't have the wherewithal to drill everywhere. So wildcatters emerged and negotiated a five million deal to get a piece of that land and drill on it. And those wildcatters are long gone. But they were a particular breed of Texas, the Texans that have become developers. So now the, the next generation of wildcatter is actually developers in Houston. And we then have a very peculiar development patterns that are very interesting to look at. Leapfrogging, what produces the holy plain, has nothing to do with the Pope, by the way. And the American distance and the alphabetic distribution. It's really an, like an alphabet soup, subdivisions. It's the suburban unit of growth. It's not the single family house. The single family house is fine, but it's the subdivision that is the suburban unit of growth. The speed zones that we talked about. And then I have a kind of new, new um, since I read broadly, biologists helped here. So I'm talking about attractors and agglomeration economics and something on a new strip. So leapfrogging is uh, a, an interesting concept. Uh, you buy a piece of land, you build a, a beautiful su little subdivision, 
what happens around you is that the land prices go up. So the next developer who doesn't want to pay more, he, he jumps over that piece of land and finds another piece of land fur, further out and gets a good price. This leaves sort of a land banking in a city like this, and that's what's called sprawl. But in fact, it's a very, very clever uh, kind of leftover space that then slowly, when, uh, when pre economic pressures uh, are put on, on, on the land, in fact, you start building there. So you, ha you have, in the end, a holy plain. The further out you, ha you go, the bigger lacunas there are. And all of those lacunas are little embryos of the moist prairie because they've never been touched. You find the, red, the same red ants that, that crawl up your leg and give you terrible trouble. You, fi you find the, dark, the hog wallows, where the hogs used to wallow in the hot weather. You, and, and you find it identical in these spots. So there is a reminder of the original uh, moist parry surrounding you. Of course, you don't see it because you're on, you know, on your errand. All these errands uh, make it impossible to see anything. But here you see the whole, uh, you see the paved bayou, you see the freeway, you see the endless parking. Uh, you know, this is Houston. And you see the promise, like in, 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 uh, in Mexico, you see, you see the, uh, the rod iron sticking out on, on the second floor, suggesting there's going to be a third floor sometime. Well, here, they lay out the infrastructure in the cul-de-sacs, because this is cul-de-sac country. This, I mean, if this is the end of the American dream, you end up in a cul-de-sac? I mean, that, then we have really you know, lost it, as far as I'm concerned. Since you know, we have given up on space, Americans are going to have real trouble reinventing it, uh, and so they move to Silicon Valley. And by the way, Silicon Valley is a suburb. Not everything happens in cities. It comes as a surprise to all these uh, people who are completely obsessed by cities, you know, like Londoners and so on. No, it happens in the country too. It's just, and the reason why it happens is the internet. Because that software, has invaded these forlorn places, and, and now you, everybody's connected. It's just that they don't go out and look like I do. So we have American distance. You get this sort of landscape, and there's always distance. Like this is down to the, just, a, just a couple of inches away from each other. That's the pavilion. And so all of these have very interesting ecologies. I, I just very briefly here, it's something that I've spent a lot of time on. I've looked at the single family house over the years. You wonder how you can park two cars, cars in that garage with two holes over there, but until you realize that this, that just holds up before they put in the real beam behind it. But look at the picture in the, in, in, look, at, look at the, this is actually uh, advertising from the 50s. It hasn't changed very much. We live in a free country. We're selling here electrical equipment. At the same time, we're selling a lifestyle. This is what women do, the woman with the oversized turkey there. She's a happy kitchen engineer. Above it, the women are concerned with beauty, and men are concerned with, with uh, the hard stuff. I mean, it, 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 it is how these vehicles, the single family house has been a vehicle for propagating a whole culture. And they, they are just a sort of a coat hangers for a much different agenda, in which capitalism, of course, has had, and consumerism has had an enormous impact. And our biggest threat is, in my view, consumerism, because we do not know how not to grow. How do we reinvent our economy to actually grow backwards? And it's no chance that that will happen in this area because they wouldn't know how to deal with it. Oh. So the making of distance finds its ultimate expression in the subdivision and the gated community whose internal roads all end in cul-de-sacs. In light of the American obsession with mobility, these spatial forms suggest an unfortunate neurosis whose therapy may reside in constructing a new frontier that removes all cul-de-sacs. Here, the original American dream of overcoming of distance may reinvented, may reinvented come to our rescue. 
I love the freeway. Ah, it's wonderful. The speed is liberating, and it's beautiful, spectacular. Growth happens around those freeways in very distinct ways, in what I call the speed zone. And here's where you see how internal self-organization in, in, that are often big franchise organizations are finding their locations and push, pushing each other around. And aggl agglomeration economics, like there are four gas stations competing with each other in the same crossing. And, and these kind of amoebic, they're like sloppy organs that, that uh, are developed along these freeways. And behind it are the housing areas, and they're trying to protect themselves from the invasion. But often now you also see high-rise buildings moving into to the inside of, of the speed zone. So there is a kind of mixture, and reminding us again of Lagos. New strips, different than the tra traditional strips, since they de develop along perpendicular and connected to freeway interchanges. Then this is a kind of fairly risky argument, but in order to understand how unflat the surface in a city like this that is really flat is, is to understand how particular locations causes attraction. Because ultimately, it's location, location, location. And those attractors created enormous kind of real estate turmoil around them. So if you buy in the apron of one of those attractors, you have to realize that you may either lose money or make a lot of money. You cannot plan on it being slow and, and different. So those attractors, for example, around the medical center, the, the, the people living out there are nurses and doctors, and the nurses are living further out because they're less paid. Doctors are paying closer. Or if they're really wealthy, they live very differently, and they have a chauffeur taking them. The Galleria, for example, is the shopping center. Or, or if, for example, if you're going to have a facelift, you come from Santiago de Chile, you fly in, you have a facelift, the rest of your family go down to the Galleria and shop. So that then, it's all interconnected, you know? It's sort of like, once you have a credit card, you see this sort of, it, in the old days, it used to be the stir up on the horse that made it possible to, to carry the lance and kill someone. Now it is the connection between the bank and the credit card and the internet and all that. That, that forms a kind of a strange linkage that, is a, that has a certain robustness that allows you to, to live lives in various ways. So if you then interview, which I did, developers, they seem to follow uh, at least five principles. Competition, financing, almost impossible now. The banks are hoarding all the money in the US. Um, they sit on it in order to show off. Rules, eh, regulations, codes, and accepted. Uh, but it's it's uh, politics. The NIMBYs, not in my backyard people, they are the ones that drive cities in America these days. And that, those are the real kind of defenders of real estate value. You can't have anything like that. Don't, oh, the bananas build absolutely nothing anywhere. But the NIMBYs are, are, are a formidable force that really serve now as a new kind of self-organizing planning device. And then the market. In a lousy market, like uh, nothing happens. So all the developers follow roughly these same rules. And they navigate around each other. You lose a deal, you know to the next, and you do the leapfrogging business. But this self-organization then has a particular behavior pattern that, that you can distinguish and that you can study. And those behavior patterns then form the whole city. I know far too little about this to really speak in any, any uh, these, these are kind of wild guesses on my part on how it works. But I have a suspicion that it sort of works this way. This is what happens. A developer moves into a neighborhood. He scouts around, finds that the real estate market is weak. Starts to buying up uh, houses, buying them cheaply, and then he doubles the density, makes a killing. 
Then this, the, the, the small fish, the pilot fish, come in and do a couple of more. And the whole neighborhood changes. And this is where all the, uh, the, you know, the social democratically involved people, oh, this is uh, uh, terrible. But it's a fundamental element in the re renewal of the city. And this is really how it develops and, 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 and grows in cities like Houston. And then you can look at the major tracks of like the medical center that has enormous impact on its surrounding. And it's a kind of virtual impact, although it shows up in land prices and house prices. And of course, in traffic conditions and pollution and so on. This is how it began up there in the, in the left-hand corner. And it grew incredibly rapidly to, to, to projection of 2050. And it's just gobbling up more land, making more hospitals now further and further away from the medical center. And the medical center itself is going through a transformation. It used to be a literary place where patients would come. Now only the worst patients come there because it's really a place for research. So the whole transformation of the, of, of the ecology of each, of each of these places can be studied in detail. And that, of course, alters the economies of the whole city. So, uh, you know, here is this just sprawl kind of town. Well, it has a lot of life in it. So, traditionally, uh, we, we, uh, we looked at geography as being, you know, points and lines. And um, then I stumbled over a Swedish photographer, uh, for, for, for Torsten Hegerstrand, that introduced time geography, which is a wonderful concept. And he's a brilliant guy, still quite dead, I guess, these days. But uh, architects, of course, look at space and form. Now, oh, pardon moi. We now have to look at um, what I call either in, in there's a very beautiful word in German called Stoffwechslung which is in some sense better than metab metabolism. But there is a kind of metabolic quality of cities, like uh, of all cities, and maybe of all conurbations. And when we begin to understand, and uh, uh, Stoffwechslung is more interesting than the notion of metabolism, because that's drawn ex exactly from our body, where we on the left side produce, on the left side we produce, uh, I'm still, I have a, I know what's left. Uh, with the left side, you produce energy, and of course, in the catab catabolic, uh, you get, get rid of it. We know how much difficulty we have with garbage and so on. So we, we need to begin to look at cities as dy dynamic, almost organic constructs. And that requires, I mean, in a program like this, where, which is wide open, you can hit, you can hit the guy just like, uh, for example, I, I, in, once in Colombia, I came to a town where they had no cars, only airplanes. You can hit it with a stride. In other words, you can hook into the evolution of, of, of the architectural enterprise and start looking now and invite uh, physicians to talk about metabolism and begin to make real research on cities to look at them, how they metabolically function. So. We have a wonderful future. Now, what counts as infrastructure? And I will rush through this really fast. And I, uh, there is, a, of all town, there is actually a Levitt town in, in, in Puerto Rico where I live uh, uh, many, many months of the year. Um, and uh, this is, a, I presume you have seen pictures of Levitt town. It's sort of little housey houses. You have smoke coming out, little families in cars, you know, wonderful things. Look what happened to it here in, in uh, San Juan. It turned Spanish overnight. But the single, you know, there were two basic boxes, what I call a single box and a double box, all made out of concrete and cement block because they discovered that hurricanes don't do too well with wood, so no, no wood construction, flat roofs, and then all these accoutrements of Spanish tradition that is applied. So where is the infrastructure here? I would argue that it's not only the street and the sidewalk, but also those, those basic boxes. And it, it, at the same time, you now also have to, re, to include social networks in the infrastructure. So when you start to look at these modern cities, what is the most important thing to install 
what infrastructure should be installed. And we have a whole menu now ranging from hardware to software. So this is just going through. You can see how, how, how uh, people change the facades. Here we see the, the ambitions of, of the lower middle class. Some simpler, some fancier. Some real expansion is buying two of them and building one thing on top. On top. And I want to finish with something um, as an idea. In 1990, I was in, a, in, a, in a Berlin, actually in Dessau, at the Bauhaus, and with Richard Rogers and, and a whole bunch of very important people. And we made the attack on planning. Planners were out and architects were, you know, we were going to we show our muscles. And I think that we have still never really abandoned the, the idea of a master plan. And the notion of a master plan is extremely problematic of, because of change. The, the, the moment you draw it, it's already wrong. So how do you deal with that? What, what are the vertebrates, the infrastructures, the, 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 the necessities that we need to draw? And should we not then? have something quite different at the end. I did a, a project last summer by invitation from Göteborg City, which is uh, on the west coast of Sweden, uh, with a, a French group that I've worked with called Grau. And we approached this. Uh, this is a river city, a network city. Network cities are, of course, all those cities that are vulnerable to flooding and located all over the world, from Amsterdam and on. And those network cities are the most vulnerable in, in climate change. But they're also fundamental, of course, for the economy. In Göteborg, for example, is where Volvo and, and uh, Ericsson, all, all the major industries that you know about, uh, actually emerged. And they, they emerged, interestingly, SKF, for example, which is a ball bearing system, it's very effective. That emerged out of a factory that made nets for fishermen. Swedes are weird. So we looked at four um, sites, because they were all, all extremely in, along a very, very broad river that is, in some sense, or surmountable. So on the one side live the poor people, on the other side live the, the, rich, the rich people. Of course, in Sweden, everything is relative. But there is a, a uh, four kind of adjacent um, islands of activity, the old town, that is actually based on Palmanova uh, in, in Italy, built by the Dutch as a strategic position between the Norwegians and the Danes that were pushing. And it has that old uh, you know, uh, exoskeleton of that army uh, engineers built that around walls that now is a park, of course. So it has the imprint of that beautiful, uh, very poorly functioning Italian city uh, that was the, uh, one of the ideal uh, Renaissance cities implanted up here in the north. To the right side, to the right side, I see it the same way. Oh, really stupid, am I not? Uh, there is the railroad, and uh, on the opposite side of the river is a kind of uh, like a Silicon Valley emerging. On the left side is a, more or less an abandoned harbor. So we gave them a proposition for a self-sustaining energy cycle. Although Sweden doesn't have big energy problems because of the water power, we argued that we could connect, because of the peculiarity of each of these sections, we could connect it together and make a closed system. So when one was sleeping, another one was working in this system. And we provided that as the master plan for an end, and then we began looking in detail to see what the opportunities were in it. It was sort of like a, a, the French notion of terroir. That there, in, in the terroir, for example, in the wine country, there's something in the soil, something in the air, that you uh, kind of try to captivate and animate by, by planting wine. But each of these particular sections had a kind of potential of being a terroir of a particular kind that we could see development. So we developed each of those islands in various ways and eventually ended up with a toolbox. 
and the toolbox will be available to, the, to those who are in charge of planning so that they would have this basic uh, energy infrastructure and they would have a toolbox. And that toolbox would be forever expanding. And some of the things will be considered sort of utopian and still, but there are sustainable technologies, there are all kinds of new uh, ways of getting across the river. So this is what we, we gave the city, and we still have to see if they're going to use it. But so I'm trying to argue here that first we should spend much more time understanding the complexity of self-organization because we would be, do a much better decision of what kind of infrastructures we use. And then we have to literally write in change in what we do. And there is where uh, it is extremely important to understand what's the problem. Are you, are you trying to tell me to stop? So that's what we're up to. And uh, so, but of course, I'm talking out from the other century. So you shouldn't pay too much attention to me. <laughs> Thank you very much.